Hi everybody. In this lecture I want to come back to something which I've been putting off, which is the vector nature of rotation. We've been talking about how omega and alpha, uh, angular velocity, angular acceleration, and torque are all vectors, but I've been kind of cagey about uh, what is the direction of each of those things. And so in order to do that we want to talk uh, specifically about how do we deal with vectors when we're dealing with rotation. And we're going to talk about the direction of the angular velocity, angular acceleration, and how torque and angular momentum are related to vector cross products. So this is mostly from Surway and Jewett section 11.1 uh, .1 and 11.2. Right, so I'm hoping that after we go through this you'll be able to understand uh, what is the direction of angular velocity, angular acceleration, and torque. And in order to do that you need to learn uh, something about the vector cross product, which I think is probably familiar to you, but um, we haven't discussed it in this class, so I'll review it a little bit. And I hope that you'll be able to apply uh, the vector cross product in the setting of torque and also in angular momentum. And uh, in addition to this, you'll need to learn about something called the right-hand rule in order to determine the direction of a cross product. Okay, so we know that uh, we've been using this convention that if something is spinning in the counterclockwise direction, we have a positive angular velocity and in a negative, um, if it's spinning in the clockwise direction, it has a negative angular velocity. But the better way to describe angular velocity is with a vector. And the vector actually points perpendicular to the plane of rotation. The reason why it's hard to define a vector is because like every point on, for example, this disk that's shown here, every point is, uh, has a different direction of its velocity. So what direction could you possibly assign to the angular velocity? And the only thing that is common to all of those is that they are uh, perpendic there's a vector that's perpendicular to all of them, which is this, um, this vector omega, which is shown in the picture there. So in order to determine the direction of the angular velocity, we use this what's called a right-hand rule. So for example, this one, this uh, disk which is rotating, I guess you would say it, was, it would be rotating counterclockwise if you viewed it from above, from where the hand is. And what the plan is, what you do is you, you take your, the fingers of your right hand and you curl the fingers in the direction of the rotation. So on that one that is being shown there, the person is like curling their fingers in the direction of the rotation almost as if they're grasping onto the axis. And then the direction in which your thumb is pointing is the direction of the angular velocity. You can see the figure shown to the right, the disc is rotating in the opposite direction so they have to, to grasp on to the uh, axis of rotation. They have to turn their, their hand the other way. The thumb is pointing towards the disc, so the angular velocity is pointing kind of down and to the left. Okay, so those are the, that's the way you determine the direction of the angular velocity, is you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the rotation. Whichever direction your thumb is pointing is the direction of the angular velocity. So this is a little more detail about, about how to do that. How about angular acceleration? Um, angular acceleration is also going to be perpendicular to the plane of the disk. Okay? And uh, the easiest way that I remember it is that if the object is speeding up, the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. That makes sense. That's also true in linear motion, right? If something is speeding up, its acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity. So if the object is uh, speeding up and rotating, the angular acceleration will be in the same direction as the angular velocity. And if the object is slowing down, alpha and omega will be in opposite directions. Okay, so now that part was for angular velocity and angular acceleration. The directions are given by this kind of right-hand rule by curling your fingers in the direction of the rotation. Now how about torque? Torque also has a direction and um, it's a little more complicated. You know, torque is RF sine theta. It depends on the force, but the direction of the torque is not the direction of the force, okay? And in order to really define the direction of the torque, we need to do something first. We have to do some math to remind you about this thing called the cross product. Okay, so let me remind you about cross product. There's two ways, well, there's maybe more than two ways, but there's two ways that we'll talk about in this course to multiply vectors. Okay, the first one we, we learned was the dot product. When we're doing work, we learned uh, the dot product. That's where I take two vectors, I do this thing, and out comes a number. Okay, so the dot product takes two vectors and gives me a number. 
There's another way of multiplying the vectors called the cross product. So that takes two vectors and it gives me another vector. Okay, so dot product is different than cross product. The dot product gives me a number, the cross product gives me a vector. So C, let's say C is equal to A cross B. That's the cross product of A and B. And it's got this messy definition. So here's the definition in this green box here. If I want the X component of C, I take AYBZ minus AZBY. Okay? And if I want the Y component of C, I take AZBX minus AXBZ. And if I want the Z component of, Z, uh, of C, I take AXBY minus AYBX. Okay? So this is just a kind of ugly definition, but that is the definition of how I get the components of the vector C from the components of the vector A and B. Very care you have to be very careful with the cross product. It's not like normal multiplication. The order matters. So A cross B is not the same as B cross A. All right, so be very careful with that. So one way to do cross product is you can just memorize this definition, but let me show you another way that I use it and that I use, and then there are other um, methods that you may have learned in your math classes for how to kind of remember how to do the cross product. Here's the way I do it. I write a matrix which is three by three. The first row is i hat, j hat, k hat. The second row is the first vector in the cross product, ax, ay, az. The third row is bx, by, bz. Okay, so if it's a cross b, I write a on the, the second row and b in the third row. Okay, now for the first component, what I do is I take, basically I take the determinant of this matrix. And if you don't know how to take the determinant of a matrix, the first thing I do is I, circle the vector, the first one here, i hat, and I write i hat there. And then I cross off this row and this row, and then I take a y times b z minus a z times b y. So I take this diagonal, a y b z, minus this diagonal, a z b y. That gives you the x component. Okay. Then for the y component, I put a j hat there, and I'll use the same colors. So j hat comes here, cross off this row and this row, and then I do the same thing. Take this diagonal, ax, bz, minus this diagonal, az, bx. So I kind of visualize myself going like here to here, multiply those two, minus here to here. There is one annoying thing about this, which is that the y component comes with an extra minus sign, which is out in front here, which is very easy to forget. So there's always an extra minus sign in front of the J. And you ask, why is that? It's just because that's just the definition of the cross product, okay? So you have to remember to include that extra minus sign. Finally, for the Z component, I write K hat there, cross off this row and this row, and then I do the same thing. So this times this minus this times this. So that's how, how I do it. If you have your own method of doing the cross product, you're welcome to do that. Let's do an example. So here's a cross product of A cross B. A is six I hat plus two J hat minus K hat. B is two I hat minus J hat minus three K hat. So let's work out the cross product showing that method. So the first thing I do is I write my matrix I hat, J hat, K hat. And then I write the first vector, a, in the second row. So that'll be 6, 2, minus 1. Those are the components of the vector a. And then the third, the third row will be the second vector in the cross product, which is b. That'll be 2, minus 1, minus 3. OK? All right. Now I take the determinant of this matrix. So I take i hat, first thing, take this cross off this row and this row, and then I multiply this times this minus this times this. Okay, so what am I gonna have? I hat times two times minus three minus a minus one times minus one. Okay. Okay, now let's do the J hat component. So take my J hat, cross off this and this, the things that are in the row and column of the J hat. The j hat comes with an extra minus sign, so you have to remember to put that extra minus sign there. And then I take this times this minus this times this. So here we go. 6 times minus 3 
minus a minus one times two. Okay. Finally, the z component. Cross this off, cross this off. This times this minus this times this. So I get plus k hat six times minus one minus whoops minus two times two. Okay. And what do I get here? So two times minus three is minus six minus one. That's minus seven i hat. And then I have minus j hat times 6 times minus 3 is minus 18 minus a minus 2. So that's minus 16. Minus 18 minus minus 2. 16 plus k hat times minus 6 minus 4. That's minus 10. So all in all, I get minus 7 i hat plus 16 j hat minus 10 k hat. Okay, so there's your example of calculating a cross product. Here's a clicker question. What is i hat cross j hat? So it's a little practice doing cross products with the i hat, j hat, k hat notation. Pause the video, see if you can think about this one, or maybe work it out using that same method or your own method. Hopefully you've chosen one of these answers. By the way, two of these answers you can tell right away are wrong. It's because a and b are not vectors. Right? Remember that a cross product gives you a vector. So it's got to be either c, d, or e. Okay, the right answer is in fact c. So if I use that same method, the first vector is 1, 0, 0, right? i hat is a vector which has an x component of 1 and a y and a z component of 0. And the j hat, uh, sorry, j hat is a vector which has a y component of one and the x and z components are zero. So if you use that same method, you would end up with i hat cross j hat is k hat. It's a generally true thing that if you take the cross product of two vectors, uh, the vector that you get is perpendicular to the two that you started with. You know, k hat is it perpendicular to i hat and j hat. Okay, so that's how you get the components of the cross product. What if I want just the magnitude of the cross product? It turns out that uh, we talked about the dot product is a, b, cosine theta. Magnitude of a, magnitude of b, cosine of the angle between those two. The magnitude of the cross product looks the same, but with a sign there. So the magnitude of the cross product here is equal to the magnitude of a, times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle between those two. So that's how I get the magnitude of the cross product. Remember the cross product is a new vector. What's the magnitude of that vector? It's the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle between those two vectors when they're put tail to tail like this. A vector has a magnitude and direction, so this is the magnitude of the cross product. What's the direction? Uh, I can get the direction from the right-hand rule. Okay, so here's a right-hand rule, a different right-hand rule than the one I discussed before. So you take, if you want to find the direction of A cross B, you take the direction, the fingers of your right hand, and it might be reversed because of my camera, so uh, your right hand, you put your fingers in the direction of the first vector. So if I'm doing A cross B, I put my fingers of my right hand in the direction of A, just like this person is doing here, and then you Imagine pushing that vero, arrow A into the arrow B. So imagine those are like two pencils and you're pushing one into the other, like curling with your fingers. So this person is curling their fingers from A in the direction of B. The direction of the thumb is the direction of the cross product. Okay, so in this particular example, A cross B, C, the direction of the A cross B is up Right, in the direction of this person's thumb. Okay, now what does this have to do with physics? It turns out that torque is a cross product. Okay, so you probably remember this formula. Torque equals RF sine phi, magnitude of R, magnitude of F sine of phi. 
And then I just told you that for any pro any cross product, the magnitude of the cross product is the magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of the angle between those two. So by comparison, you can see that torque, this thing here, is the magnitude of a cross product. So, so torque is actually R cross F. R is that radial vector from the axis to where the force is applied. F is the force vector. Okay. So if I want to do the torque, I can either do the cross product using the matrix determinant that I just described, or I can tell you the magnitude, RF sine phi, and then find the direction from the right-hand rule. Here's another clicker question. What's the direction of the torque caused by the force F? The axis of rotation is shown. So again, imagine this is like a rod which can rotate. Um, I guess I should do it this way to match the screen. Um, and I'm pulling with some force like this. What's the direction of the torque? Got some choices there. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can answer this one using the right hand rule. So hopefully you have voted. You have chosen one of these answers now, committed to something. So you're going to use your right hand rule. So remember torque is R cross F. Torque is R cross F. R is the vector that goes from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. So R is here. Okay. So the first thing I do is I put the two tail to tail. R is this way and F is this way. You have to put them tail to tail in order to use the right hand rule. So this will be R and this will be F. Now I take the fingers of my right hand and I put them in the direction of the first vector, which is R. So I take the fingers of my right hand and put them in the direction of R, which is pointing to the right. Now, um, when I put my fingers to the right, there's many ways I could rotate my hand. So I, like any of these, are, my fingers are still pointing to the right. You know? Now I have to rotate my hand in such a way that I can curl my fingers from R into F. So the only way to do that is like this, right? So my fingers of my right hand are in this direction. I'm pushing the vector R into the vector F. So I'm putting my fingers in the direction of R. And imagine pushing the vector R into the vector F. My thumb is coming out of the screen. Okay? So you should get the answer directly out of the screen here. So that's an example of finding the direction from the right hand rule. Okay, so you have now, we've talked about cross product, how to do a cross product. We've talked about torque as being a cross product, R cross F. And we've talked about how to figure out the direction of a cross product using the right hand rule. I want to do the same thing with angular momentum. Okay, so now let's go switch from torque to angular momentum. Angular momentum is also a vector, and it turns out it's also a cross product. So let's work out this. I'm going to derive this formula, um, so let's do a little derivation here. I'm going to look at this quantity called R cross P, and you say, why are you looking at this quantity? It's just because I happen to know the answer, and it's going to give me something that I want. Okay, so just bear with me for a moment. Let's take the derivative of this combination, R cross P. Let's do a cro product rule. So the first term is the derivative of R crossed with P, and the second term is R crossed with the derivative of P. Okay, so I did the product rule on that combination. Now P is MV, so the only thing I did in this line is I put P equal to MV, so that should be fine. Now this term here, dP dt, you should recognize that. Remember that Newton's second law is that the net force is equal to the change in momentum, the rate of change in momentum. So dP dt is actually the net force, external force. Okay. And what I did here is dr dt, that's derivative of position with respect to time, that's velocity. Okay. So that's mv cross v plus r cross the net force. Okay. But a vector crossed with itself is zero. Okay. You can try that out when using the definition with the matrix determinant, or you can know, uh, know that, um, remember the magnitude of the cross product is the vector A, magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of the angle between those two. If the sine of the angle between those two is zero, 
then the cross product will be zero. Okay, so V cross V is zero. And the thing on the right is R cross F, which is torque. Okay. So compare this thing. This is gone. I have the derivative of something is equal to the net torque. So I'm comparing this. This is net torque here on the right side is equal to the derivative of something, which is R cross P. From a previous lecture, we know that the net torque is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum. So if I compare those two things, I see that apparently I have to identify the thing that I'm taking the derivative of, L, has to be the same as this. So here's an expression for L, the angular momentum in terms of a cross product. L is R cross P. So you have two cross products. Torque is R cross F, L is R cross P. Those are the main formulas that I want to get across in this set of slides. Okay, same idea. If I want to figure out the magnitude of the angular momentum, L is R cross P. P is MV, so I can just plug in R cross MV. What's the magnitude of the angular momentum? It's the magnitude of the first one, R, times the magnitude of the second one, which is MV, times the sine of the angle between those two. Remember, the magnitude of a cross product for any two vectors is the magnitude of A, magnitude of B, sine of the angle between those two. So for example, suppose you've got this mass down here, which is moving that way. It has some momentum that direction. And I want to find the angular momentum from some point, some axis of rotation. So let's say in this example, the axis of rotation is at the origin there. So R is the position of the mass. You can see it's that black vector in the diagram. Uh, P is the momentum vector, which is pointing in the plus Y direction. And so the magnitude of the angular momentum would be MVR sine of the angle between those two vectors, which in this case is here. Okay. And how about the direction? The direction comes from the right-hand rule. It's got to be perpendicular to both R and P. So the angular momentum of that object is actually pointing in the plus Z direction. And you can see that if you get your right-hand rule. Put your fingers in the direction of R. Curl them in the direction of P. Remember, you've got to put them tail to tail first. So I should put them like this. I should put R like this and P like this. And if I go R cross P, my, my right hand rule, fingers in the direction of R, curled in the direction of P, I get my angular momentum pointing in the positive Z, the positive Z direction. Here's another clicker question. At the position shown, what is the direction of the angular momentum of the object about the center of the circle, assuming it rotates counterclockwise around the circle? So. Our origin here is going to be at the center, so I'm computing my angular momentum around that point. See if you can use your right-hand rule to determine the direction of the angular momentum of that object. Pause the video and see if you can do that one yourself. So hopefully you have chosen one of these answers. We should draw a vector r, so r is this direction. We should draw a vector p, which is this direction. The momentum at this moment is that way. R cross P, put them tail to tail. Here's P, here's R. Put your fingers in the direction of R, curl them in the direction of P. So imagine pushing R into P with the fingers of your right hand. Again, I find that my thumb points out of the screen, so out of the page. All right, so something that is kind of confusing the first time you see it is that an object which is moving in a line actually can have angular momentum. And let me try to illustrate that with this slide. So angular momentum has to be defined relative to some point, some origin. And it depends on what your origin is, uh, whether it has angular momentum or not. Okay? So r is the vector from the origin to the moving mass. So let's say our origin is at the point A there. And this is my mass m here, which is moving to the right with speed v. If my origin is A, then my vector R goes from the origin A to the mass, and then uh, V is this way, and you get 
the angular momentum around point A or about point A is RMV sine of this angle, phi A, which is not zero. Okay. On the other hand, if I choose my origin at point B, I have R and V in the same direction, which means R and P are in the same direction, which means the cross product of those two is zero. Okay. So you can see that uh, depending on my origin, I can have a different angular momentum. Okay. And even though I'm moving in a line here, I still have some angular momentum. And in a sense, uh, I can kind of understand this because if I imagine this object going from the left to the right, passing point A, it's in some sense going, quote unquote, around point A. It starts on the left side and ends up on the right side, right? So uh, let's do an example for angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum in a collision. So here we go. A ball of clay is thrown at a door with a speed 18 meters per second, collides and sticks to the door, which has a mass 8 kilograms and a length 1.5 meters. The door is initially open at an angle of 60 degrees. How long does it take for the door to close if the clay hits the exact center of the door? Okay. So this is the picture that we have. We have initially the door is open. This is a kind of overhead view. And then the, the ball is going to stick to the door and the two are going to swing to closed together. Okay. How long does it take for the door to close? So this is a collision problem. You're tempted to use conservation of momentum because you, you're used to using that in collisions. But um, you can't use conservation of momentum. PI is equal to PF because there's an external force provided by the hinge. OK. So that hinge there, this guy, is holding the door in place, right? It, the door can rotate around the hinge, but the door can't go forward. So there's an external force. The hinge is holding the door, keeping it from moving forward uh, in the plus x direction. And so I can't use PI equals to PF because we can only use that when there's no net external forces on the system. But we can use LI is equal to LF. So our plan is going to be to use Li conservation of angular momentum equals Lf. Why can I use conservation of angular momentum? Because there's no net torque on the system, right? So the hinge force provides no torque. There's no torque from the hinge force. because it acts at the axis. Remember, its radial vector is zero. So if you push directly where the thing is rotating, you can't create a torque. You can't change its rotation. So we need to use the um, conservation of angular momentum. We want to use Li is equal to Lf. OK, so what's the angular momentum of the system to start. The system is going to be the ball and the door together. The ball is moving in a straight line, but on the previous slide we saw that something moving in a straight line has an angular momentum. Okay, let me go back here and show you. So if I have an object up here which is moving at a speed v, the angular momentum of that object about some point A is d m v and d is the closest distance of approach there okay so d m v so what is the angular momentum here l initial it's going to be the distance of closest approach which is here d so d times m times v okay let's just do the magnitude d M V. VI, let's say. Okay. Okay, what is D? This distance here is uh, L over 2, the length of the door, right? And this angle here is uh, 30 degrees, right? Because the door is open 60 degrees 
So the original, the uh, that angle there is 30 degrees. So D is going to be L over 2 times cosine of 30 degrees times M times VI. Okay. That's going to be my initial angular momentum. What's my final angular momentum? Here I have a pure rotation. Right? So I'm going to use this formula, I times omega f. Again, let's do the magnitude. Okay. So the moment of inertia times the final angular velocity. And what is the moment of inertia? I have two pieces. I have the eye of the rod. It's like a rod, right? It's like a door rotating, a rod rotating about its edge, plus the moment of inertia of the point mass. Two things are rotating, right? The, the door is rotating and the mass is rotating. Each one has a moment of inertia. The total moment of inertia is the sum of those two times omega f. Okay. All right, so there's our conservation of angular momentum. We have to set Li equal to Lf. What's that going to get us? We know L, we know M, we know Vi. We can figure out these moments of inertia. So this can give us M. So I'm going to use my plan here. It's going to use uh, Li equals to Lf to determine omega f. That'll tell me how fast is the door rotating after the collision. And then I will use kinematics to find the time it takes to close. OK. All right, so let's do it. Li is equal to Lf, conservation of angular momentum. What did I have here? I had m v l over 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees is equal to the moment of inertia of the rod, which is one-third the mass of the door. Let's put a big M there for the door times L squared plus the moment of inertia of the piece of clay, which is M L over 2 squared times omega F. Okay, so let me just be clear. This is a I for a rod rotating about one end. And this is the moment of inertia of a point mass. I for a point mass is mr squared, right? And why did I pick r as L over 2? Because when I think about the rotation of this uh, point mass, it's rotating in a circle of radius L over 2. That's this distance here, L over 2. Okay. All right. Um, let's solve for omega f. Omega f is equal to uh, 1 half m v l cosine of 30 degrees divided by uh, one third big M, the mass of the door, L squared, plus M, small m, L squared over four. Okay. Okay, there's an L on a top on the top and L's on the bottom, so I can cancel those. And I get one half M V I should be a factor here. Divided by one third, the mass of the door times L plus M L over four times the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay. Plug in the numbers here and I get the magnitude of omega F is 0 0.931 radians per second. That's the final angular speed of the two objects together once the ball of clay has collided, that's the speed at which, the angular speed at which they are rotating. Okay, so we did this. Use kinematics to find the time it takes to close. Okay, so now it's going to rotate at a constant speed. So kinematics. 
let's use this equation. Theta f is equal to theta i plus omega i times t plus one half alpha t squared. So the door is going to rotate at a constant velocity, so there's no acceleration. Door uh, rotates closed at a constant velocity, omega. And theta f is going to be zero because I want to know when it's closed. Right? Okay, so what am I going to have here? Theta i is 60 degrees, but I need to convert it into radians. It's pi over 3 radians. And uh, this omega i is the initial angular velocity, but it's, before I called it final, it's the same as this, right? Final, it's after the collision, but it's the angular velocity that the thing is, is slamming closed with. So let's put it in now. I'm going to have 0 is equal to pi over 3 radians minus 0 0.931 radians per second times t. Why did I put the minus? Let's see if you can think. It's because it's a clockwise rotation. This is clockwise. So I have here the magnitude of the angular velocity, 0.931. But because it's going clockwise, then I, I know that the sign that I should include there is negative. And that's the only thing that makes sense. It's going to give me a positive time. Okay. So finally, solve for t. I get pi over 3 radians divided by 0 0.931 radians per second. I get 1.125 seconds. So there's an example using conservation of angular momentum before and after a collision, um, and then combining that with kinematics. Okay, so take a step back. It's a complicated problem. Remember that if something is rotating, it collides and then there's a rotation, you can't use conservation of momentum because the axis is exerting an external force. But I can use conservation of angular momentum because the axis is not exerting any torque. I wrote the initial angular momentum of the object, which was moving in a straight line, but it still has angular momentum. And the final angular momentum is i times omega, and I needed to include both the moment of inertia of the rod and the moment of inertia of the mass to solve for the final angular speed. So this part here, this was the hardest part of the problem was getting this omega. Once I have that, it's fairly easy to figure out how long it takes to close at that angular speed. Okay, so let me just summarize. Um, in this lecture, I introduced to you the cross product, the vector cross product. So hopefully you know how to compute a cross product, and you know how to figure out the direction of a cross product by using the right-hand rule. I also told you that there are two cross products that show up in rotation, um, which in physics, right? One is torque is r cross f, and angular momentum is r cross p. Okay? So these two equations down at the bottom here are the ones that are most important. And we use this to, to see this, it, it has an application in collisions that if an object is, is traveling in a line, it still has angular momentum about some origin. You can figure out the value of the angular momentum by finding the magnitude of that cross product, rmv sine of phi. Okay. So I hope you found this, um, this lecture useful. Uh, I hope you can go back over those problems and make sure that you understand how to do them. Thanks again for your attention.